But now let's turn to uh, God's Word. This is our, our third sermon on the Songs of Repentance. We began in Psalm 6. We then looked at Psalm 32 last week. In a couple of weeks, we're going to take a break from this and return uh, to 1 Corinthians as we go through that book. But today, we come to the most important and famous of the penitential psalms, or psalms of repentance. Uh, this is Psalm 51. In fact, it's so important that we're actually going to take two weeks uh, on this psalm, finishing up next week, Lord willing. And if you think that two sermons on one psalm is too much, uh, I discovered in my study that one well-known preacher took 17 sermons to go through this one psalm. And as we look at it, I think you can see why. You've already sung and read parts of this psalm four times already in the service. And now let's read it all as a whole. We won't be able to go through it all in detail, but I do want us to hear it all as a whole to us, as God's word this morning. So let's hear God's word. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, you delight in truth in the inward being, and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins. Blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a bright spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and uphold me with a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will return to you. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, O God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. For you will not delight in sacrifice, or I would give it. You will not be pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. A broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. Do good design and your good pleasure. Build up the walls of Jerusalem. Then you will delight in right sacrifices and burnt offerings and whole burnt offerings. Then bowls will be offered on your altar. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray for God's blessing. O oh Lord our God, we thank you for our brother David and the great repentance that you gave him and as a, as a model for all of us. We pray, O oh Lord, that you would teach us in our secret hearts, that you would help us to delight in your truth in our inward beings, that we would be renewed, that you would create in each of us, O oh Lord, new hearts as we attend to your word by faith, and as your spirit blesses, in the name of Christ I ask this. Amen. I'm sure I've told you all before about my first uh, car uh, that I drove. It was a, a 1961 VW Bug loaned to me by my father. And I know many of you have heard this before, but I love it so much I'm going to bore you again with it. Uh, one thing you might not know is that in, in 1972, this VW Bug actually spent a year uh, on the island of Guam in the middle of the Pacific. My father was in the Navy, and uh, he was aboard a submarine tender. And so they allowed him to take his VW Bug on that big Navy ship across the world, really half the world, and then back again. Uh, and so it spent a year in the salt of the Pacific, and, and it, it, it looked it. Um, I don't know if any of you cadets are in the Navy, and, uh, but if you ever get deployed somewhere overseas, you can try that. I don't, I don't know if the Navy lets you bring cars overseas anymore, but you might as well ask, right? So by the time I got it, it had a rusting cord, it had no seat belts, I don't think it was issued with any. 
It had no gas gauge at all, so you knew when you were running out of gas when you started to halt in the middle of the road, <laughs> then you had to flip it onto the reserve tank real quickly. Uh, it, it had no heat to speak of. You, the, the little heat was from like the exhaust pipe. Uh, you undid a little lever, and the, ga the gas didn't come in. The exhaust didn't come in, but the heat from the pipe came in. Um, certainly no air conditioning. I don't know that that was even invented back then. Um, it had windshield wipers, which was a good thing, but interestingly, uh, the windshield wipers would slow down when you press the brakes, and they'd speed up when you press the gas. I still, still have to figure out how that happens. It was not much to look at, but I loved that little car. It was also a miracle that I survived driving that car for a number of years, but we'll save that for another time. Um, now, some of you may own cars like that because, well, you're in college or high school, and you got the family hand-me-down, or you're able to buy what you can afford uh, from a friend. Uh, I'm looking for Ryan and his brothers. So you still have that station wagon. Is that thing still running? Yeah. Maybe you own some car that barely functions. It's rusting, vintage, mid-80s or something, but you love it. Now, suppose that you had a fellow student who lived on your hall or your apartment complex, but this fellow came from money, and he had a bunch of cars. Uh, when he turned 16, his daddy gave him two cars for his birthday. One, a, a Cadillac SUV. I don't know, do they even make those? I don't know. You know, a really large, nice car, luxurious car. And then another, a sporty little European sports car. He had two cars. And then he bought two more to go with it. And he had his personal assistant drive them all to college. And they were all lined up outside the apartment. But then, for some reason, he decides take a liking to your car as well. And somehow, he steals it from underneath you. He tricks you out of the title. And so that it no longer belongs to you, but it belongs to him. And he didn't even need that car, but he just took it because he could. Well, how would that make you feel if someone did that to you? Or maybe it happens to a friend of yours. Now suppose that you're not the person whose car was taken. But you're the guy with the abundant line of cars who did the stealing. And you say, well, I, I would never do that. I'm not that kind of person. Well, I'm su sure it surprised King David as well. When the prophet Nathan showed up in 2 Samuel chapter 12 and told David a similar story. Only this time it involved a poor man who owned one little beloved sheep that he just loved like a child. And then his rich neighbor, who owned flocks of sheep, but the rich neighbor needed to put on a meal. And so instead of slaughtering one of his own sheep, of which he had hundreds and didn't care for any of them, he instead stole the poor man's sheep and had that slaughtered instead. And when David heard this story, as king, he rightly stood up and said, this man deserves to die. And then Nathan turned to him and said, Thou art the man. And immediately David knew what he was talking about. And maybe you do as well if you know the story from 2 Samuel 11 of how when David had finally arrived in Jerusalem after years of persecution and God had finally delivered the capital into his hands, that after some time when everything was going well, Israel went off to war. But David, having arrived as a successful king, stayed at home. And then one day, with too much time in his hands, he's wandering on his roof, and he looks down into another roof, and there he sees a woman bathing, whose husband was off to the war David should have been fighting. And so David calls for that woman, Bathsheba, to come and meet with him, and they sleep together. And then a short time afterwards, she sends notice that she has become pregnant from David. And then David, now wishing to cover up his tracks, in a long and convoluted story, arranges for her husband Uriah to be sent into the most dangerous place in battle where he will certainly be killed. And then he covers all of this up for at least nine months, knowing what he has done before the Lord and before man. Maybe somehow excusing it until Nathan the prophet comes to him. He says, Thou art the man. 
I don't think we can overestimate how important this particular story is in the whole of the Bible. In my view, David's sin against Bathsheba and Uriah and the whole nation, right there, in the middle of 2 Samuel, that's the climax of the whole Old Testament. Or you might better call it the anti-climax, the great disappointment of the whole Old Testament. Now, many would dispute with this, but that's the climax. And it's surely the calling of Abraham, or the rescue out of Egypt, or maybe the exile and the return, or, or something like that. But what do I mean by this? I mean that when David ascended to the throne in Jerusalem, finally, all of God's promises to Israel appeared to be fulfilled, at least to the eye. He had built them into a great nation, as he had promised to Abraham. He had rescued them from Egypt and redeemed them. He had conquered the promised land for them. And he had given them a king after his own heart. And then finally, God's city, the city of peace, became the throne of God. And the temple was about to be built. And so finally, when everything looked like it was coming together, it all fell apart. And that would eventually lead to Israel's exile and distress. And it becomes downhill from this point on. Oh, I know there's some bumps and there's some upswings along the way. The temple gets built. The nation grows under Solomon. There's some great kings. But by and large, everything starts to fall apart. Why? Why? Because David was not Jesus. Do you see the difference? A thousand years later, Jesus also would enter Jerusalem in glory. He would come in hailed as the victor, as the, the king, the son of David. But when Jesus came into Jerusalem, what did he come to do? He came not to steal and to conquer and to assert his rights as king. What did he, you know this. If you don't know this, you need to know this. Jesus came in to bear the judgment of God upon this world, to come as a servant and to die upon a bloody cross for the sins of everyone he came to save, for all of his people. When David enters Jerusalem in glory, dancing along the way in that wonderful chapter, he was given every advantage to be a godly king, but he ends up acting like every other two-bit dictator, taking what he wanted and killing those in his way. David became, the, the David, arguably the godliest man in the Old Testament, a man after God's own heart. David became a hit at least at that moment. That's why I call his great sin of the Old Testament the Antichrist, of David grabbing power and living for himself instead of dying to himself as our perfect servant king Jesus would do. David had already become the greatest man of his generation before he wrote this psalm. He was an accomplished military soldier and then a general, a talented musician and a poet, a writer of holy scripture, he was, in general, a very wise and merciful king. He was a man after God's own heart. So what happened? If we look at the psalm and we read David's description of what he did, what, how in the world did this happen? Why did he give in to his sinful desires? And when we do the same thing, what do we do? That's why this psalm is so important. If I'm right that this great sin of David's is the anti-climax of the Old Testament, the anti-cross. Well, then this psalm is the way back. This psalm is the great balm and answer for David's great sin, and therefore it serves as a guide for us. Notice, look, we know from the title the occasion of this psalm. That's why I told you that story from 2 Samuel. But notice in the psalm itself, he never mentions the specific sins. Why? Because it's for all of us. We are all to own this psalm as our own. It's a gift of God to us. So as we look at this psalm, I think it's best divided into three parts. First of all, we see David's confession of sin in verses 1 through 6. Then we see these very heartfelt pleas to God in verses 7 through 12. Oh, God, would you do this for me? And then in verses 13 through 19, we see these wonderful results that come from David's repentance. And we'll have to get to those next week. I can't wait to get to those, to be honest with you. I was kind of sad that I could I did so much that to Jesus. We couldn't get there this week. Uh, well, I, we, I want to, you know, I want to go eat lunch. So um, <laughs> they're, they're preparing a potluck. We got to get back there. So, but, but look at verse seventeen. This is this is what I can't wait to get to. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. Oh God, not, that is biblical theology. That verse explains, in some ways, the whole the, what we need to do in order to be saved. And it's repeated again and again throughout the scripture. So 
Uh, but today, as we look at this first part, verses 1 through 6, uh, I want to make six observations from this first section as we have time. Basically, one per verse. So let's take a look. Let's begin in verses 1 and 2. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy. Blot out my transgressions, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. Now these are the general heading of the entire psalm. Uh, David's setting the scene. He's already beginning to make pleas to God here. Wash me, cleanse me. And we'll look more at those next week as he goes into more detail in the next section. Uh, so I just want to make a couple of observations this week. First of all, notice how David uses three different words for sin. It's the same three words we saw last week if you were here. Transgressions, iniquity, and sin itself. And each one describes a slightly different perspective on what it means to disobey God and its result in us. And so we won't go over those again. Um, uh, if you weren't here, I guess it's going to go up on, on the website eventually. And you can listen to it. But the point is, is that David has transgressions, he has iniquities, he has sins, all of which need blotting out, washing, cleansing. David is saying, now I know, Lord, that I'm horribly sinful. It's not just a little bit here and there. I don't just need a little dab of cleaning. I don't just need a little dab and a band-aid. I'm a wreck. I'm a big mess from the inside on out. And then that leads to our second observation. Notice, then, the basis. Right here in verse 1 upon which David pleads for mercy. Have mercy on me, O God. Why? Because I've earned it? Because I've worked my way back in? No. Only according to your steadfast love. And many of you know this is the famous Hebrew word, hesed. A God putting his covenant, by God's sovereign decree, putting his stamp of love on David. That's the only plea that David is making here. He's not trying to work his way back into God's favor. He knows that he is so bad that all he can do is rely on God's mercy. And that, that's why I think this psalm is especially helpful uh, to those of us who are middle-aged or older. And yes, I am middle-aged. And thankfully, I'm, fr frankly, I'm, I'm actually glad I'm finally starting to get some gray hair, so I finally get some respect around me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not scared of gray hair at all. I, I crave them. <laughs> Just as I crave the grave at one point when God would bring me home. But if you're not that old, I think this psalm is for those of us that have been walking with Christ for a while. This David's sin with Bathsheba was not a sin coming out of youthful indiscretion. You know, I think of politicians sometimes when their past is dug out, uh, and they say, well, when I was young and irresponsible, I was young and irresponsible. Don't hold that against me. No, this is a sin that came out of an experienced and normally godly believer. You would not have expected this turn in the story if you were reading David's life. Where did it come from? I, I think it came out of David feeling entitled or perhaps discontented. He finally arrived at the top and he realized in his middle age that this was as high as he was likely ever to get. And yet he was still not content. He was not finding his delight in the Lord, but he was looking around for the things of this world to fulfill. This happens to middle-aged people. And if you are young and you're not there yet, you think, I'm going to be fine. Look, you need to build up a new patterns of faith and godliness that will absorb the trials of this life. And, and, and you're, 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 you're looking forward now to a life of optimism and God blessing you, and I expect he will, but there are also going to be trials. There are going to be great disappointments. And the Christian life, then, is one of constantly returning by faith to trust God to supply our needs. Right? Some of you are middle-aged. Can I amen this? I, what Presbyterians don't say that. But I hope you're amening in your heart. This is a struggle for us. So what happened to David? He allowed himself to spiritually slumber. He did not see his need for daily grace. That has to be what happened. And so he blew it, and he blew it big time. But this didn't come out of nowhere came out of a lack of faith. He blew it, just like so many of us have, after years of following Christ. Maybe uh, you grew up in the church. You were given every advantage, wonderful parents, terrific teaching, wonderful friends, and you were pretty good for a time, at least outwardly. But then you fell, and you fell hard. Or some of you are, look, there are enough of you here that some of you are just arriving in college. And you're doing okay, relatively speaking, with the Lord right now. But you're going to blow it sometime in the next four years. You're going to do things that pagans do. There are enough of you here that probably one of you is going to do that. The question then is, when that happens, is there grace for you? 
Is grace only for unbelievers that then need to hear the gospel and then God forgives them? Or is there grace for believers who fall into sin? That's exactly what the psalm is for. That's exactly why Paul in Romans 4 uses David as an example of the experienced believer who falls into sin and is saved by the same grace that first saved him, right? David is someone who fell hugely. He turned away from God, but then he turns back to God. And how did he get back? Did he earn his way back? What saves David? What is his hope? That's what verse 1 tells us. Lord, have mercy on me according to your steadfast love. Love that David had from before the foundation of the world. Love secured for him by the cross of Christ. And love that David could never lose, no matter how great his sin. The point is this. This grace is for all of us. This grace that Jesus came is for all of us. Those of us who have just come to Christ and are reveling in it, oh, I can't believe I'm completely saved by what God has done. And for those of us that have walked with Christ for many years and yet continue to fall into sin. It's the same grace. What? Do you think you somehow unearned God's favor? Of course you have. But that's not what saves you. What saves you is his steadfast love put upon you by his grace through Jesus Christ. And it's shown by the fact that you're continuing to return to God that you're here this morning. Maybe you got dragged by a friend. That's why you need to be taught in the inward part, as verse 6 says, and taught in the secret heart that you're coming to meet with God, that you are returning to God despite your sin, you're coming back. That's evidence that, that God's steadfast love is upon you, not because of what you have done, but because you're coming back to Christ. So we've learned two things. Now let's look, move on then. The third observation then comes from verse 3. David says, I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Look, David owns his sin. He doesn't slough it off as something that just happened to him because of his difficult upbringing or because he didn't have a puppy when he was a kid or something like that. He doesn't also say, look, God, look at all the things I've done for you. I, I built up your kingdom. I survived years of persecution. And then you just sent this, this, this naked woman to me. It's your fault. He doesn't blame God. He doesn't blame Bathsheba. No. David knows that God allowed the test of warfare to arise, which David then failed by staying home. David knows that God then allowed this test of coveting to occur, which David then failed. God then allowed Bathsheba to become pregnant to see if David would then do the right thing and confess his sin. But no, David tried to cover it all up, leading to murder. And so David rightly says, this is my sin. I did it. I know it. And the word here doesn't just mean that he can list it out intellectually and move on. He knows it deep in his heart. I know it's ever before me. What do I do? And so you may be faced with, with difficult circumstances. Some of you had difficult upbringing. Some of you are going to be given great tests. I mean, some of you going right into college, you are going to be given unbelievable tests. Whoever thought it was a good idea to send young people at age 18 and, and to mixed dorms uh, all together. I mean, it's, 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 a, it's a mess. So what do you do? When you blow, do you blame the circumstances? Or do you own it as your own? Your fault. <coughs> Many of us Thursday night were able to hear a woman named Rosaria Butterfield. He wrote a book about being saved from unbelief, she says, but as the world would look upon it, the form her unbelief took happened to be homosexuality. And as God worked on her through just a very patient and loving witness of a Presbyterian minister up in Syracuse, New York, she eventually came to faith in Christ. And for her, it was all about repentance, about learning to die to herself. And her particular sin, what form of selfishness, was, was homosexuality. But the, her point is, is that we all face different things. We're all faced with, with different particular sins that we are inclined towards, that we're born with. And she said, pointedly, that for some people that is a same-sex attraction, but if they continue to repent of that and to believe the gospel, then they are heroes of the faith. We aren't to blame God for the tests he brings our way. He brings us those tests for our sanctification, to help us see our need for Christ, and to help us die to ourselves. Others of you maybe grew up with very materialist parents, parents that love money and love stuff, and it's just kind of infected you, and you're going to live with that the rest of your life. Don't blame them for that. 
When you love things more than God, that is your fault. That is your sin. That's what David is saying here. David's saying, I know my transgressions. My sin is ever before me. What we need to do is we need to do right in the face of great difficulties. Some of us face greater tests than others. Some of us face greater temptations than others. But our obligation and our primary devotion and love is towards God and doing what is right in His sight. That's what David is saying. That then leads to the fourth point. How do we then grow in Christ-likeness? Look at what he says. Verse, he says, against you. You only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. You're justified in your words. <coughs> blameless in your judgment. Now this, this seems mighty strange, doesn't it? I mean, after all, think of all the people David sinned against. He sinned against his army by not leading them in battle. He sinned against his wives by cheating on them. And yes, he had a couple of wives. But that's for another sermon. He sinned against Bathsheba by sleeping with her. He sinned against Uriah by stealing his wife and then killing him for it. He sinned against his general Joab by involving him in the conspiracy. He sinned against the whole nation by letting them down. So how can David say, I've only sinned against you? Well, he doesn't mean to say that he did not sin against these folks. And that he needs to apologize and to make restitution to them, which he does. And one of the most beautiful parts about the story, if you know David's story, is that after this, his sin and his repentance, he becomes just unbelievably merciful and gentle towards fellow sinners. It's one of the most beautiful pictures of grace in the scriptures. Even as his world is falling around apart, around him, his kingdom is crumbling, he becomes a gentle and gracious man towards his fellow sinners because he knows how much grace has been given to him. But what David is saying here is that first and foremost he failed God. That what primarily went wrong in his life in the midst of all of his success, in his middle age, wasn't the fact that he didn't go off to war, wasn't the fact that he saw a woman and suffered. What the problem was is that he sinned against God. He was neglecting his, his, his need, his relationship with the living God, his need for daily grace. It is God whose holiness sets the standards of righteousness, which rules the universe. And so whatever we do, whatever we do in life, we need to do it to God's glory first and foremost. Always, everything we do is, is geared towards the love of God. That's the first great commandment. And when we do that, then that then causes us to love others properly. See, the, the problem is, is when folks feel bad about their mistakes because they got caught or because they can see the bad consequences and the damage it causes them and others. That, that's good enough as far as it goes. But it's not repentance. Repentance is turning away from your sin and towards your need for God's mercy. And it's first and foremost always towards God alone. That's what repentance is. It's your relationship to God, turning away from your sin and back towards God and God and Him alone. That we're sorry for our sin, not just for the damage it caused others, but for the fact that it came from who we are. We're sorry because it offends our Maker, who loves us, and who grants us eternal life in Christ. That first and foremost, whatever damages, whatever risk we're doing, we want to get right with God. That is what David is saying. So let's move on and see this more from verse 5. He says, now this is a very important verse for a number of reasons. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin, and my mother conceived me. This verse can also be misunderstood. But what do we learn? Well, first of all, just as a sub-point, first of all, just notice that David considered himself a person from conception on, right? The whole of the Bible assumes this. So don't listen to those misguided teachers that say a fetus does not become a person until it breathes oxygen. They, they're not getting that from the scriptures. David considered himself a real person while he was still in the womb before he took a breath of oxygen. Secondly, this verse teaches the very important doctrine of original sin, which all Orthodox Christian churches hold to. Now in our day, this is not a doctrine that's well known or loved. But what David means by this is not that any sin is original, right? That, that's, it's a funny phrase. It doesn't have to do with that. And he doesn't mean by this that, uh, that the actual conception was sinful. 
After all, procreation, and I'm, I'm using family-based language here, procreation was commanded to us before the fall into sin, right? Be fruitful and multiply, God commanded Adam and Eve. So that's not the sinfulness that David's talking about. What he means is that David was sinful from the moment of his existence. He was sinful in the womb, from conception, before he had done a single act, before he had any memory at all. He was born into a sinful race. And that's what made him sin. Now, obviously, not everyone <coughs> believes this. And some churches even teach against this, and they think they're being gracious, but actually it's the opposite of grace. But what some teach is that we are born good, but then gradually we become sinful as society corrupts us. So if we could just fix society, then, you know, then we'd all be okay. And it's possible, in theory, they say at least, to stay good if we're able to resist these corruptions. Actually, I don't know if you know this, but Islam teaches this. They teach that people are basically good, which is why their religion has so little grace, which makes sense if you think about it. If you're basically good, then you should be able to fix yourself just by becoming a Muslim, and if you don't fix yourself by becoming a Muslim, then you go to hell, because it's your fault. No, what original sin teaches is that it teaches about the origin of sin, that it goes back to the origin of our race and Adam and Eve. That's where sin comes from, and that we all inherit this rebellious nature which Adam and Eve chose for us. That if we had been there, we would have done the same thing. They represented us, and we are born into this. It's part of our warp and woof. It pervades us through and through. So what David is confessing in this verse is that it, it's, is that his sins are who he is. It's not just like that he had a bad day, that he was generally a good guy and he just had a bad day. No, what really happened is that these sins revealed who he really is apart from the grace of God. In other words, listen carefully. David was not a sinner because he sinned. David sinned because he was a sinner. Do you see that? It's who he was. This is what confession is. It doesn't make excuses. It doesn't just repent of the surface actions, which reveal our hearts. Say, oh, God, just fix those up. Uh, I said something mean to my roommate, and so next time I'll just use more polite language to tell them that they didn't do the dishes. You know, no, it, it, it sees where it comes from. It comes from our hearts. It repents of not just what we do. It repents of who we are apart from God's grace. What does Jesus say about this? When asked about what makes a man unclean, whether it's the food that you eat or not, this is what he says, and you can think about this as you enjoy the puppet. He says, do you not see that whatever goes into the mouth passes into the stomach and is expelled? But what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart, and this defiles a person. For out of the heart, this is Jesus describing us, out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, Adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, slander. These are what defile a person. Do you see that? It's not that we just fall into these things and otherwise we're good people. These things come out of our heart. It's, it's, it's who we are. And so when we fall into sin, even as longtime believers, in a way that's not a surprise, it's, it's, it's who we are apart from God's grace. C.S. Lewis puts it this way in his wonderful book, Mere Christianity. He says, suppose you have a basement. And uh, in the basement, there are rats, but you don't know the rats are there. And you turn on the light, and all of a sudden, the rat, you see the rats. You see, what we do, he says, is we go around and we're able to clean ourselves up because we want to live in society and, and, and not be outcasts, so we hide our sins. And there's a certain propriety to that, of course. But just because you're hiding them doesn't mean they're not there. When the light of the gospel shines in and exposes your sin. It wasn't the light that put the sin there. They were, it was there all the time. And so when you find yourself sinning, that's who you are. That's why you need grace. And so if we're sinful through and through from conception, how is there any hope for us? That is exactly why there is hope. You see, suppose you were born good and that you just fall into sin from time to time. You're just a little bit sinful. Then what you need to do is come to church for some self-improvement, Right? And, and my job then would be to give you practical little pointers and how to become a better person and make a difference in the world. Just, you know, fix yourself up a little bit. But you see, that would be bad news. If you're coming here for that, that that's bad news. Because then 
getting better and better would be up to you alone, because you're already a good person, you just need to make yourself better. And you would never then know whether you had done enough to make God happy with you. Whether you had done enough for God to say, yes, you're good enough to earn my favor. And you'd be this constant burden to fix yourself, and to, 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 to wonder whether you're accepted by God. This is exactly what works religions teach. And even some forms of Christianity let that slip in. But what if your problem is so down deep that I cannot do anything about it? And you cannot do anything about it. That what you need is cleansing within. You need it within your soul, which I cannot reach because I'm just a human. What you need is renewal in your heart, and you cannot do that because you're just a human. And there's only one person in the universe who's able to provide that for you, and that's God himself. That's exactly what he does. And so your job, then, is to come here and to go to your campus fellowship meetings or, or, or your, your different Bible studies, to come to meet with God and to let him work on your heart. And then it's my job, then, to preach the gospel by which God does that, to proclaim to you God's wonderful grace in Christ, which changes your heart, of how when Jesus entered Jerusalem, it wasn't to lord it over us or to give us new commandments that we could not keep, although he does do that. But he gave us those commandments so that we would see we cannot keep them, and that we must depend on him to keep them for us. And that Jesus came to Jerusalem to be the perfectly gentle king, not to judge us, but to bear that judgment on his cross, so that we're saved entirely by grace. And we don't get there until we see that we need to be saved by grace. We don't just need self-improvement pointers. We need a new heart. We need cleansing within. As John says, God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. That's my job to tell you that. That God did not send his job to the his son to the world, to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. And whoever believes, you come with all your sin and all your mess, whoever believes is not condemned. That's the promise of the gospel. With all of your sin, deep within, this is who you are. But if you believe in Christ, you're not condemned. You will live forever. All of your sins are blotted out. All of your sins are wiped away. Now, hearing that, when you hear that, what does that do to your heart? And when you hear that again and again each Lord's Day, and especially at the Lord's Supper, what does that do? If that doesn't cleanse and renew your heart within, nothing will. And when it cleanses and renews your heart and gets you right with God, then you're just going to want to respond with a life of thankfulness and joy and brave obedience. And love others. And start living for others instead of yourself because God's got your back. That's what David says when he does in verse 10. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a right spirit within me. He wrote this as a believer, as somebody already converted, as somebody who's already said the sinner's prayer, who's already done the altar call. As a believer, he says, What I need first and foremost is a cleansed heart, a renewed heart. That's why I wanted to preach these sermons as we began a new school year. That's why I needed to hear these sermons in my middle age. <clears throat> that is why and what we each need to hear most is as you face different tasks and challenges ahead of you, and you'll, you'll face them. What you need most is, is a renewed heart, a cleansed heart, hearts to remind of God's grace to you. And so as you look, as you look at this coming year, and as you fall into sin, which you're, which you're going to, like this afternoon. Remember this. You, you may need some practical helps, some accountability, some improved habits, which you can nurture. We're going to help with that. But what you will need most is a cleansed and renewed heart, and that is something that only, only the Holy Spirit can do. That's why we pray for people. Because, you know, we do get into trouble. Christians do get into trouble. And I can't fix all that. I can't even fix my problems. Don't ask me to fix yours. <laughs> I can't keep you from sinning. I can do what I can practically. I can try. But what folks most need is for God to change them. That's why we pray. That's what I need most need. When I look at my sin habits, when I look at my patterns, the things that have made me grumpy and self-entitled and prideful, I need a renewed heart. I need a cleansed heart. I need to be right with God. And then the other things, they, they're not easy. But at least I know what to do. And it's more of who I am as I become more like Christ.
And so all of that takes us to that sixth verse in our last point, which we've already talked about what we need. As David says, Behold God, you delight in truth and the inward being. You teach me wisdom in the secret heart. It's not talking about a secret knowledge that nobody else has. He's saying, I know this experientially. I know this in my heart. I need to be right with you in my heart. That is how we fight our sin and live for Christ. That is the real battleground. This is our hearts. It's, it's living in Romans 7, as Pastor Rolo read for us, learning to wrestle with our sin, learning to hate our sin more and more, and acknowledging it, but then returning again and again to the grace of God. That's how you're growing in grace. Not covering it up and pretending like everything's fine, but just saying, I am a mess. But in Christ Jesus, I'm raised, I'm washed, I'm cleansed. I'm a king and a queen. Or a queen. <laughs> So as we'll see next week, this is precisely what it means to worship God. In the only way that God, David says, is acceptable. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. This does not mean that we go around being sad all the time. It's the exact opposite. We should be sad if our joy is based on our own righteousness, on our own works. But it's precisely because we are broken by our sin that we have joy, because then we find our joy not in our works, and whether we live up to God's standards, but because we already have received God's grace. Our joy comes from what he has already done for us in Christ Jesus upon the cross and by his resurrection. We're already raised up in Christ, and so it's precisely because we're broken by our sin that we have the joy of the gospel. It's just as Paul writes in Romans 7 and 8. For I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is in my flesh. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Therefore, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That is why we sin. That is why we rejoice. Because we are first broken by our sin. God receives that as worship and then lifts us up by his grace and sends us into the world to be his witnesses of his grace to others who need to be. Our God and the Father, we come in. And even though it's hard to do real hard work with you, to look at our garbage, to look at our selfishness, to look at our pride and our inclination to wander, yet we do so precisely that we might have more of Christ, that we might be more like him, and we might be reminded that we will never lose Jesus. As, as we trust in him, he will always bring us back to himself, and so we rejoice. Strengthen us now to remember that grace when we fall into sin, to give that grace to others who also will fall into sin. We might be as merciful as you made David, and even as merciful as Christ as you work in us. We ask these things in Jesus' name.